This week on the Four Rivers Ag Report, harvest is just about complete, but one question remains, how did we get the yield we did? Also, we get a national perspective on the corn crop from a combine hundreds of miles away. And if you don't know where you are, how do you know where you're going? <laughs> that and more on the Four Rivers Ag Report. The Four Rivers Ag Report is underwritten in part by the Department of Geology and Geography is a proud sponsor of the Four Rivers Ag Report and provides integrative learning opportunities for students and the community to explore the physical and cultural world near and far. Welcome to the Four Rivers Ag Report. I'm Fred Peralta. Now, most of you are done with harvest, or <laughs> will be as soon as there's room in the dryer for the remaining couple of acres. And the general consensus around here is that we did much better than the weather gave us any reason to believe we would. Corn yields have been hovering around the 200 bushel area, beans around the 50, all with a soggy spring and a bone dry summer. And when I talk to the producers as to the why, I've heard cool summer weather, deep soil moisture, and on more than one occasion, genetics. Now, many farmers noted that the plants took nutrients from the stalks to fill out the seeds. And that made me think about how these traits are developed and manipulated to keep producers producing. So I've talked with a crop agronomist about how the seeds can save the day. And with me now to answer all of my seeds and genetics questions is, is Kelly Bassett. She's a crop agronomist for Pioneer Seeds. And, and Kelly, you talk to farmers all around this area, talk to dealers all around this area. What are their concerns about seed selection this time of year? Well, as we're finishing up harvest for a majority of central Illinois, growers are looking at product performance from a yield perspective mm -hmm. across their acres to determine what products they want to select for the next growing season. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately becomes the number one thing growers look at when they se select and determine what they want to plant the next growing season. But we also bring in a lot of other things to that decision making that they may weigh more or less based mm -hmm. on their own operation. And that might entail agronomic things like stock, standability, disease, insect, a whole lot of other things besides just yield. Okay, now speaking of that, in talking to my crop guys this year, you know, we, we, they did not expect to get the yield they got. And you're talking about stalk health. So many of them thought that the stalk gave up moisture to, to complete the yield, to complete, to fill out the seeds. Is that actually what was going on this year? We saw a lot of stock declination and degrade towards the end of the season. Mm -hmm. We as agronomists and those in the field attributed that to the late season stress from heat and lack mm -hmm. of moisture. And as we started to get closer to harvest, we anticipated that that could have actually hurt yield. Mm -hmm. When in the other side happened, we had very <laughs> good yields. And I think what happened is the plant had such a tremendous sink or ear that it set mm -hmm. as far as corn is concerned mm -hmm. early in the season that the plant took everything it had to finish completing that grain development and fill. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have as much left in the stock at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. Granted, we didn't run into situations where it became an issue from a harvestability mm -hmm. Had we had a later fall and moisture and wind, we do know that our stocks were not going to last till this time frame mm -hmm. or Thanksgiving because mm -hmm. they didn't have that kind of right. integrity. And there were some occasions of uh, straight line winds knocking down some areas of crops, but not nearly as much as I thought. And and honestly, the the farmers have all been very happy. How, did they flip a coin and were lucky or, or were, were they smart? Well, I think a couple of questions that we're trying to answer from this growing season compared to what we've just experienced is, was there any leftover fertilizer? Was there anything that we didn't count on from 2013 mm -hmm. or 2012 taking such a poor crop off of the right. field that maybe has helped our crop in 2013? Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of cases, growers harvested zero to 40 bushel yield yes. in parts of the state that would typically see 200 bushel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, did we let the soil rest? Did we leave some of that fertilizer there? And then was it picked up in our crop in 2013? Mm -hmm. That's a question I don't know if we can answer, but it's certainly going from our worst crop to one of our best 
best crops. Right. And then when you put the two together, we're still at average. <laughs> um, but it, it feels so much better to take in that 200 bushel yield this year, especially off of last year. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we did something different, I would say it's probably the environment that changed for us than what we did differently mm -hmm. to manage from mm -hmm. 12 to 13. Now, projecting ahead to 2014, how does a producer choose what to plant as far as what seed type? Well, from a producer perspective, we always go back to making sure that they recognize they need to plant a package of products, mm -hmm. whether that's corn, soybeans, or whatever crop that they're looking at, mm -hmm. because we can't outguess Mother Nature. <laughs> as we've seen from 2012 to 13, a drought and then our best year back to back. Right. Um, one thing that we look at are performance over multiple years. So if a grower gets a new product for the first year on the farm, we also look at previous history, whether it was in our research or in early stage development to understand what performance the product has and what environment it fits. Mm -hmm. But we will recommend to a grower to look at multiple products to fit multiple environments because where we're at in Illinois, Fred, um, I've told several people this, but we have an opportunity to either have a Western kind of environment okay. or an Eastern environment. Okay, so you don't, you don't narrow the environment down to state specific, you, it's more region. Well, if you look at Illinois coming in the middle of the, you know, the Midwest, mm -hmm. we can go Eastern with kind of a cool, wet or cooler and wet, cloudy, mm -hmm. or we can go Western, more of a hot, dry. And you see those environments and it's almost a 50-50 of what Illinois is gonna experience a lot of years. So from a standpoint of, do we pick hybrids that have very good drought tolerance or do we have products that have very good upper, you know, top end yield always, we want to mix those so a grower has better risk management right. for their operation. Right. Um, our central Illinois environment can go either way. Um, so when you get to the southern part of the state, we do start to tail off and follow more of a, a, a mid-south kind of mm -hmm. environment. So, okay, so that's, that's interesting. Now, you mentioned uh, disease and, and, and disease control. There's been some migration of you know new weeds like water hemp and marstail um there's the corn root worm is showing mm -hmm. back up are those considerations that uh farmers need to take into take into uh, consideration and are seed companies thinking about those sorts of problems too those are definitely on my mind from a perspective of how can I help a grower and make sure that they're managing for those insects or diseases or weed pressure. Mm -hmm. From the weed management perspective, um, as we see that migration of water hemp and mare's tail slowly moving north, well, we definitely want to remind growers to look at their weed management program. And by that, I mean keeping fields clean. And so one thing that um, a lot of individuals are looking at are fall applied herbicides mm -hmm. so that when they start in the springtime from a soybean perspective, their fields are clean and they can keep them clean. They don't have to knock it down then. Right, but even on the corn perspective from that, um, we're encouraging growers to try and keep the fields clean in the fall and it becomes an issue as you slowly move farther north of Route 16 or across um, what I would say into the prairie soils for Illinois. Mm -hmm. It's not as much of an issue farther north, but keeping those fields clean so that when they get to the field in the spring, they one, don't have that weed pressure to slow when they get into the field mm -hmm. to plant. They have less insect pressure from a black cutworm or other insect perspective mm -hmm. when they get started and then their seed beds are smoother. So weed pressure, definitely something, but on the selection issue for insects, um, with corn rootworm being an issue annually across the state of Illinois, growers have a couple of different options. And the first being that a lot of them look at is in plant insect protection. So mm -hmm. whether that be an insect trait from the three different main companies that provide protection with in plant protection, mm -hmm. or whether they look at a soil applied insecticide, rotation, all of those things fit into it, but certainly the traits mm -hmm. are where most growers put their um, faith in as okay. far as for protection. So a lot to think about when you're sitting there in the combine bouncing across the field, right? Certainly, a perfect time for you to start thinking about next year. <laughs> well, of course, because there's always next year, right? Yes. Oh, Kelly Bassett, thank you so much. Thank you, Fred. I'm Casey Berry with a look at your farm news. Well, we've seen quite a bit of rain over the last couple of weeks, more than our normal amount for this time of year. The east southeast district saw between two and two and a half inches last week. In fact, majority of the state saw over two inches. 
And thanks to that rain, the Climate Prediction Center thinks the drought may begin to clear up in Illinois. Topsoil moisture is 12% very short, 28% short, 58% adequate, and 2% surplus. Subsoil is a little drier, coming in at 12% very short, 44% short, 43% adequate, and 1% surplus. While the rain is helping moisten the soil and slow down the drought, it's also slowing down harvest progress. Corn is 82% harvested in our district and across the state, and soybeans are 90% harvested in the east-southeast district, while the state is a little ahead at 92%. We're seeing a record corn harvest this year, and as we know, when yields go up, prices come down. But it's not just corn prices. Chicken costs are being slashed to buyers across the nation. Corn prices fell 50% from last year's drought, boosting profit for poultry producers. Officials say wholesale prices will drop about 7% to 92 cents per pound by 2014. So when you go out to your favorite restaurant next year or you go to prepare that big meal at home, expect to see cheaper prices across the board. No matter what side of the fence you stand on in the global warming debate, it may be better to be prepared than not. And that's what the USDA is doing with soybean research. Bob Ellison has more. Soybeans are a $137 billion a year crop worldwide. With that in mind, U.S. Department of Agriculture researchers are studying how climate change might affect soybean production. We're looking for uh, variation among uh, soybeans in how they respond to rising atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. Bunt says he wants to find which soybean varieties farmers should grow to take advantage of increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Rising CO2 tends to stimulate yields of many different kinds of crops, and what we're trying to do is just optimize that stimulation by finding the varieties that respond best when grown at high CO2. And ultimately, we're trying to find the genes that are responsible for that, but the first step is just to find varieties that respond better than others. Bunt says finding the most CO2 adaptable soybeans is important because it will help maintain an abundant and affordable food supply. The U.S. is remarkably lucky in terms of our natural resources. The amount of money that we spend per capita for food is very low compared to most other places in the world just because we have such abundant food crops and resources to grow them. This is just trying to keep that favorable balance of food supply intact as the climate changes. Soybeans are increasingly used for human consumption and alternative fuel, but are still predominantly used for animal feed. In Beltsville, Maryland, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Bob Ellison. Well, it's that time of year again. Time to watch out for deer crossing the road. But there's some good news this year. The odds that an individual driver in the United States will crash into a deer during the next year have declined by just over 4%. State Farm says that the chances of a motorist hitting a deer over the next 12 months is 1 in 174 compared with 1 in 167 the year before. Drivers in West Virginia are most probable to have deer vehicle collisions, while drivers in Hawaii have about the same chance of hitting a deer as the Chicago Bears football team running off 13 wins in a row. Now, I only threw that statistic in there because... Fred's a huge Bears fan. So how do you avoid hitting a deer? Well, the Insurance Information Institute says to keep these six things in mind. Deer travel in herds, so if you see one, others are probably nearby. Be aware of posted deer crossing signs because those are placed in active deer crossing areas. Remember, deer are most often active at dusk or after dark, particularly between 6 and 9 at night. Use high beam headlamps as much as possible at night to see areas where deer enter roadways. Don't swerve to avoid a deer because you could lose control of your vehicle or be put in the path of other vehicles. And finally, don't rely on car mounted deer whistles. Well, finally in your farm news, a Georgia semi truck accident had a cleanup crew all abuzz. A tractor trailer tire blowout last weekend created a sticky situation when it crashed and broke boxes that were housing bees. Two lanes of traffic were closed on Interstate 75 in Monroe County, Georgia, so broken boxes containing hives and honeycombs could be moved to the grass. Now, local beekeepers took honeycombs out of the broken hives to salvage the bees' homes, and the bees, well, they stayed pretty close to their hives. The cleanup effort took all day on Sunday. Well, I'm in a sticky situation with Fred for my bears joke earlier, so I should Probably wrap it up for this week. Remember to keep it safe on the roads as the days get shorter. I'm Casey Berry.
Now, over the last month and a half, we've visited with all sorts of farmers from all over, central Illinois, that is. Now, I love to know what's happening a few counties over, but better yet, what's happening a few states over? So I got on the old internets and I found a farmer just more than a bit down the road to find out just how 2013 was to him. So Keith Alverson is a South Dakota farmer and a member of the National Corn Growers Association uh, board. And, and Keith, uh, you know, it's tough to see past the Mississippi River. How was your season this year? You know, it, it was uh, kind of up and down. We came off a drought year last year. You know, there's a lot of areas in South Dakota. Uh, I-90, I the interstate runs across the southern third of the state, kind of cuts the bottom third off. And once you got south of that, it was pretty well disaster. You know, all, all silage, you know, um, maybe 40 bushel corn if the guys were even able to harvest it. Uh, you know, and lots of zeroed out. And so we came off a real dry year. We had a dry spring. Um, got everything uh it was it was late but because of the cold weather but uh, we got everything planted um had you know really timely rains to get things going um had a cool july i think like uh, many other places but uh, it started to dry out at that time and so we had a a pretty dry july and early august and we caught a couple rains here and there um and finished with a lot of heat um so we've got you know average to above average yields in this area. Some of those guys that were in the real droughty areas have tremendous corn yields. Um, and I've been, I've been here and depending on, you know, if we caught a timely rain or not, um, some, some pretty outstanding yields coming from. So, from so this, this better than expected yield sounds like it's wider spread than, than, than not. Right. Yeah. You know, everything that I've heard, uh, you know, some of it's, goes off expectations, I guess, you know, I know there's some folks that would be uh, kind of in those problem areas in Minnesota and Iowa, um, you know, that didn't have real high expectations going into it just because they had so many problem, uh, <laughs> problematic planning issues. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think overall, we just had, we had tremendous potential because of how the year started off for us, even though we were late. Uh, we had a lot of kernels out there. It was just a matter of how we finished. And, you know, the kernel depth was huge, huge, huge every year. And, uh, you know, this was another year that was like that. That was kind of the difference, you know, where we had an extra inch or two of rain um, is where we had our best yields. And if we were a little bit short, you know, the kernels got real shallow, um, decent, fair, fair test weight. Mm -hmm. um, but it just, you know, cut back into the yield and brought us back to, to average or so. So right now you're you're sitting in the middle of a snowstorm. Uh, <laughs> how did harvest go for you? Uh, it was uh, real small windows. You know, it started off um, everything was clicking along, and we had good good conditions. And and I'd been in contact with others across the in the Midwest, you know, and, and they were complaining about weather delays. And we just hadn't experienced that, and we were uh, ahead of normal, and crops were drying down. And then it kind of has gotten into a pattern where about once a week, we'll get two or three days of, of a rain or snow. And, you know, then we've got to wait for another day or two for it to dry up. And so we'll get a window of a couple days to, to be able to go. Now, um, we had, we've had we had issues with uh, uh, the wet spring caused the corn to mature so much later. Uh, farmers stopped harvesting corn to do beans. Was it pretty much that way with you guys? You know, it was spotty here. I, I know of some guys that still have some beans out in the field. And, you know, it's pretty tough conditions it had gotten with that rain that we picked up um, or the sporadic rains that we'd gotten it brought the moisture back up and really made it tough to harvest those uh, however we we got extremely hot and dry in uh, in late August and early September and that really made our, our crop finish out um, that's what affected I, I think our our grain fill period got really short because of that and that's what affected some of our yields but it also helped finish the crop because we were behind like everybody else uh, but we, we also had, with that, that quick grain fill period, mm -hmm. um, crops dried down fairly well for the most part. Uh, the corn, you know, a lot of our corn came out at that 16 to 18% when we got going uh, the second week of October, which is a week, week and a half earlier than we typically would start. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were finding corn, you know, down around 20%, 19 to 20%. And, you know, typically we're pretty happy to find it in that area, you know, a week, week and a half later than that. I think guys are, are pretty 
happy with how the season turned off coming off a tough year. Um, and you know, with, with how the year progressed, um, you know, how it finished, I, I think guys are pretty thrilled with how things turned out. Well, Keith Alverson, uh, our new South Dakota friend and, uh, <laughs> uh, member of the national corn Bureau, uh, Bureau board, uh, Thanks a lot, and have a great, enjoy your winter of doing nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, there we, well, we're, we finished up harvest on Monday, uh -huh. uh, the day before the snow came, and we've still got plenty of fall work that we'd hurt, oh, we're hoping details, to get Details, details, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Fred. And on today's On the Map segment, we are talking about uh, map illiteracy, uh, the idea that People don't know where the heck they are these days. Yeah, it's a term that's been thrown around the internet the last couple of weeks that, that I think we've seen. And the term for that has been called emappancy. Okay, emappancy. That's, that's a mouthful, yeah. and I won't try to say it myself. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, from what you know, I think it just has to do with our overall understanding about the globe and the world and where things are, and uh, more so our lack of understanding about not only where places are at, where countries are at, and states, mm -hmm. but then how do the issues that are happening around the planet play out in those places? Okay, what's, what's an example that you can give me? Uh, just of overall map okay. ignorance. You mean, okay, you know, right. Placing wrong state names or abbreviations on some states and some, some news organizations yes. have been guilty yes. of that. Yes, uh, yeah, both sides of the aisle. Both sides of the aisle have uh, been, yeah. Okay. But there's also a sense that we get a, our maps give us a different sense of scale too, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, the whole issue with putting a spherical planet mm -hmm. on a piece of paper, a piece mm -hmm. of flat paper, you're either going to distort distance or area. Okay. So it makes, for example, the further away you get from the equator, it makes Greenland look many, many times larger okay. than what it actually is. Okay. And it also does the reverse. It makes you know, continents like Africa seem smaller than Yeah, they are. relative to those other places that are being distorted. Okay. Exactly. So. Um, Again, it's tough to put a spherical object on something that's flat, okay. but it's just something we have to deal with. Okay, so why does that matter? Um, I think it matters, again, just because as a society, as, a, as a, you know, individuals, mm -hmm. it's, it's good to have an understanding of not only where places are at, you know, the whole thing you learn about in elementary and high right. school, state capitals, right. capitals of countries, where rivers are at. That's important background information mm -hmm. to know, but it also helps us once we do understand those places to figure out why, for example, an environmental issue might be important okay. in that region, or why cultural clashes between two different groups mm -hmm. might be happening in that region, mm -hmm. uh, might have to deal with something about that place's geography, uh, so, land use, right. or religion, or something right. like that. Right, so it's, it's, you, if you know more about a place, you know more about the people. Yeah, having that background knowledge of where places are at helps you put together the pieces of the puzzle mm -hmm. that would help you better understand a more complex story. Okay, now getting back to the issue of uh, our maps sometimes make us think more or less about places. Uh, Africa is huge, you can fit mm -hmm. several, several of the other nations in mm -hmm. the world into Africa and still have room left over. Exactly. Uh, but that's even true with other places like Australia. Yeah, Australia is a huge place. You know, we don't think of it because it's, you know, we, we've talked the, only the little perimeter, the 20 mile perimeter of the country is actually more or less inhabited by people. <laughs> um, but yeah, you plop it down over the United States, a map of the U.S., and it covers basically all of our, all of our country. So if you're dealing with those places that are that big, mm -hmm. there's potential for you know, there's resources, there's, mm -hmm. there's development, there's population dispersity issues that, uh, that we don't even think about because you look at it and it's postage stamp. Yeah, so. exactly. And, you know, at the same time, our country's, our, our world is becoming more closely connected because mm -hmm. of technology, the Internet and so on. But at the same time, it seems like we know less and less about some of these places that, you know, a lot of important things are happening on. Well, unfortunately, the country's not all laid up in squares, or the world yeah. is not all laid out all in squares. Exactly. So, Chris Langan, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll look you up sometime right. on the map. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Jessica Killo with your Insight Extension. The TIAA Cref Center for Farmland Research at the University of Illinois is hosting the Farmland Markets Conference. Profitability and Future Perspectives on Wednesday, November 13th from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. at the Hilton Garden Inn in Champaign. The keynote speaker will be the U.S. Department of Agriculture Chief Economist Joseph Glopper. He will address the state of agriculture in the United States. 
U of I faculty and staff from the College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences will also give presentations at the individual sessions. Registration is required. For more information, visit farmland.illinois.edu or agengage.com or call 800-728-7511. Do you have an interest in gardening? Want to learn more about gardening, fruit trees, and how to manage insect pests? If you answered yes to these questions and have time to volunteer in the community and share your knowledge with others, then you may be interested in becoming a master gardener. Training for new master gardeners will begin soon. For more information, visit our website or call the Coles County Extension Office at 217-345-7034. As always, like us on Facebook, Follow us on Twitter and visit our website to stay up to date on our programming. From U of I Extension serving Coles, Cumberland, Moultrie, Douglas, and Shelby Counties, this has been Jessica Killo with your Inside Extension. Well, that's it for this week. Now that the harvest is almost done, well, please remember to thank those people who make it possible for you to work those 16-hour days without guilt. A farm is more than just a farmer, it's really a family. So work hard, be safe and enjoy those beautiful sunsets. I'm Fred Peralta, and thanks for watching the Four Rivers Ag Report. The Four Rivers Ag Report is underwritten in part by... The Department of Geology Geography is a proud sponsor of the Four Rivers Ag Report and provides integrative learning opportunities for students and the community to explore the physical and cultural world near and far.